today I decided to speak about finding unusual sources. Almost everybody gets into the census records and whatever they can grab online at Ancestry or at FamilySearch.org, and there's a whole wealth of other records. It's a matter of understanding how to get to them. So today we're going to do that. And why is it not moving? There we go. So what are unusual, what I consider unusual records? Uh, Josh Taylor at Roots Tech 2017 said, unusual records basically fall into two different categories. Unusual information found in common places and unusual records that appear in places people might not even think of. And we're gonna co cover a little bit of both. Some examples that I have, marriage date and military service in the middle of the deed and land records. If you think about it during the Civil War, for instance, paper was very scarce. And so they grabbed whatever book they had, which is usually the land records, because that one never goes away, and they would record things. So I have found marriage records and military service and all kinds of other stuff stuffed in the middle of deed records. So that's a common record, but an unexpected pieces of information. Now archives have a lot of information, but it's typically historical records. It's for the academics that are doing history research. And so my, a lot of genealogists, those that are into that, don't get into the family history side of stuff and delve into the uh, historical records. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then some completely unexpected places to find information, like in books that are not related to genealogy. And I'll show you an example of that from my own family history. So how do I find them? Well, I'm, basically I'm going to tell you look everywhere. And how do I track where I have been? Because that's important. Whenever you're looking at these sources, if you wait six months or a year and go back through the same places that you have before, you may find more. Everything is getting digitized more and more. So for instance, the FamilySearch.org is pushing to have every piece of, every roll of microfilm as the Family History Library digitized. And so what's there six months from now may be a whole lot more than what you have currently. And then how do you document those sources that you have? So why use these sources? Everybody starts with those census records and the vitals such as birth, marriage, and death. And then maybe you might look at probate or will, or maybe like find a grave or billion graves to find where they are buried in cemeteries. And occasionally I'll get people that'll, that'll actually delve into the wills and the probates, maybe naturalization. But it's rare for me to find somebody that can say, yes, I've looked through newspapers, I've looked through military records, I've looked through church records, I've looked through passenger lists, city directories, court and prison records. Yes, all of us want to believe the best about our ancestors, but they may have gone to prison and you may find an unusual record there. You might find photographs, union hall records, taxes, local histories, compiled genealogies, and other records that are published. Now we used to start with those local histories and compiled genealogies, but I'm finding it's more rare that people have actually looked at published books to find out what's available. So let's look at first using some of the major sites in unusual ways. FamilySearch.org is one of the mainstays for genealogy research. It is funded by the LDS Church. It's part of their beliefs that, that you can baptize ancestors so that they record a lot of things. They send out microfilm crews worldwide to do the microfilm. For instance, uh, in Texas, the Hill County Courthouse allowed them to microfilm all the records there. They had a fire. They were able to go get all their records that had been microfilmed and get another copy of the microfilm because they had allowed family, the LDS Church to do that. So FamilySearch.org is the repository for all, all that information. But you get there, most people head for that family tree. And the diagram that's up here has part of that website. So at the top you see family search, uh, family tree, search, memories, 
etc. across there. I want you to skip the family tree. Don't go looking at that yet. Don't try to go compare your family tree to somebody else or go looking for your ancestor there. Go to search. And then typically, a lot of people will go search for the records. You'll plug your ancestor's name into the records directly. That is only going to search the tip of the iceberg. That will search only records that have been indexed. Instead, I want you to skip that. I want you to go search catalog. What you're going to see is the screen on the left, and then you will, I want you to take and restrict the marriage, the records by a, the country and the state. And that would bring up records by a particular state. That's still not quite as in-depth as you can get. Instead, now you can do that, and I want you to try to do that eventually, but I want you to skip that first and go over and do search and then select that menu at the top up there where it says catalog. And what we're going to do is fill in a place name in the catalog. Now this is just like you used to go into the family history centers and they had a catalog for the family history library. And then you could actually do a search just like this and come up with an entry that looks like this. So by filling in United States, Texas, and Smith, I was able to come up this list of the family search catalog and then um, um, I went down because I was looking for land records to here. Now hint, I want you to know that that number that's there is just the number of entries, not the number of films, not the number of records. It is just the number of entries in the catalog. So there were four entries under land and property. So like there was a tax, there's a book on tax records. Here's the one on deeds. And this one says the deeds of the county from 1846 to 1906. It has an index. We're going to go take a look at that entry. So we clicked on that entry, and you get the more in-depth catalog entry. And here I see that it says there's 16 microfilm rolls, 35 millimeter microfilm rolls. Now don't panic because you would assume you may have to go to the Family History Library, order that microfilm, and do it the old way and wait for weeks and get the right microfilm and do the research. And if you want more information, for instance, if you'd have brought up a book entry in the catalog, you can click on this line at the bottom that says view this catalog entry in WorldCat. And that brings up a page that shows you where that book might be found and how many miles it is from your house if you've shared your location. So I can find that a book's in Louisville or a book's in Nashville, and I might be able to go get it if I want to go see it. But we're going to look today at, micro, at the deed records. So when I clicked on that, I found that here's the entry for the index, and here's the old film number that you would have. But lo and behold, look at this wonderful little icon out here. If you see a camera icon, that means that there are digital records online. They have taken that microfilm roll and digitized it. Likely or not, in this case with the deed records, it is not indexed. But keep in mind that these were the microfilmed film rolls. If you go to first go to this index film roll, write down your ancestor's name and the page numbers and the book numbers that you expect to find all that in, in my case, I went to book number, volume 55, and I had a page number that I was going to go to, and then I clicked on the uh, camera to go get to that film, and then I paged down to the page and found volume 57, page 193. And then in the middle of this deed, it says that Hiram Kirkpatrick of Smith County, uh, when he did this land record, he uh, that he, um, his survi he was the survivor of Adeline Kirkpatrick, his deceased wife. I did not have a date of Anne Adeline Duncan's death, and this deed record helps supply it. And then note also sat down here when he was doing the transaction of this deed, that it was the 23rd day of January, 1868, and that Hiram Kirkpatrick had already remarried a um, Mary E. Pretty. 
in the deed in the census records it was real hard to tell whether or not the census taker had made an error and or and I had two different wives or or not in this deed record when I found it it definitely proved that I had two different wives so this is the kind of thing that you can find in a deed record so keep in mind let's go to the major sites try to find other ways to search it and in familysearch.org go to search and the catalog and then go to the particular locality that you want to at the county level and you will find a lot of records that you can't reach any other way than to go search catalog and then fill in the county and go to the county entries so now we want to look at books and and paper ephemera and I want you to check your family keepsakes and other books that have been around your family's house for a long time uh, I was in junior high when I went to my grandmother's bookcase I was bored and I was there during the summer and I went and pulled a book and what I found was a Greek New Testament with English notes by ST Bloomfield and in the front it had John B Renfro Larissa Texas and <clears throat> excuse me I found notes stuck in the margins of this book including some reference some notes that he made at the end of the Civil War and uh, excuse me just a second mm, got a little bit of sore throat today the this book started me on my family history research and in the column of this book it says I'm here May the 20th 1868 and this day I am 51 years old that is the only record of his birth date anywhere I met two other researchers that have been researching John B. Renfro for over 20 years and neither one of them had the birth date and yet I did in this book that was the Greek New Testament would just happen to have margin notes with his name go looking at old books you may never know what you really have in your collection already if you're looking for some old books or you know you have a, a book that was published on your family and you want to go find a copy I recommend looking at abesbooks.com so here was an example the ancestors and descendants of Theodore Roosevelt Whitney and uh, you can buy that book for three dollars and 49 cents and so it you never know what you're gonna find at Abe's books when you go looking for a book I found a book that was published on my Kirkpatrick family and it happened to be the copy that one researcher that had done extensive research in Kirkpat and the Kirkpatrick family had sent to another researcher that had done a lot of Kirkpatrick work and I had corresponded with both of those ladies and to get a co that copy that would given by the author to the other lady was invaluable to me it was just like um, I had opened a gift and when I got that copy but I bought it off of Abe's books not knowing whose copy that was now we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about online archives we want to check books and government documents and diaries and letters but it may not be obvious on how to to retrieve a lot of that stuff so I'm going to tell you how to find things there are three major sites and this is one of them it's called the digital public library dp.la and the digital public library has images text videos and sounds from all over the United States that have been collected this aggregates metadata now when you take a photograph there is extra information inside of that photograph the date the time the camera the lens all that information is embedded in the bits and bytes that are in that photograph when you record a catalog entry for a book there is also a lot of information that you may not see when you bring up that catalog entry and that's called metadata about that item a lot of it has to do with when the library acquired the the book where they pub you know bought it from there's other metadata like that that's available and what this digital public library has done is gone out and retrieved the metadata on all the information and put it together in one huge search engine so this has thumbnails for all these photographs manuscripts books sounds and movies if the library or the archive has given them permission to do that 
So they, this is an aggregation of a whole bunch of places all over the United States, and it's all free. The, for instance, here's a, a, a photograph I found a, from a Larson studio collection that contains portraits and landscape photographs from Thomas Larson and his son, who operated a, a studio in Provo, Utah. When they closed their business, they donated it all to a local archive, and now its metadata is indexed off of this digital library. Here's an example. All the National Archives and Records Administration things that are available online are also indexed here at the Digital Public Library. Here's a declaration of intention in 1927 of a William Kirkpatrick, age 31, at the U.S. District Court in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, it, was 17, it was September 26, 1927, and uh, the he had a minor child named Mary, who was also one years old, from Everett, Massachusetts. In the bottom left, you'll notice that there's a number there, this 2637603. And that's the, the number that you can use to get that naturalization record from the National Archives if you want more information. What's online is just a thumb like an index card that you would go to a library and pull that information. But gosh, look at this index card, what information that you got off of just this, and then you could go pay money to have the actual in immigration and naturalization papers done. The Florida military records are online. Here was a, a William Dow that lived in Jacksonville, Florida. He was inducted June 21st, 1918 in Jacksonville, Florida. There's the name of the company he served in. The fact that he was born in Boydkin, South Carolina. The birth date was July 21st, 1887. And it's a nice image. You can read it very well. So the hint I'm going to give you about using the dig the digital public library search is be sure and use quotes. So when I looked for William Dow, I put quote William Dow quote so that I would have both words in the search. Then you can refine your search here on the left and I selected, if you select Ohio River, it'll only bring up the 46 records that have to do with the William Dow in the Ohio River. I want you to also note that these, that this Dow search brought up a William Henry who was in the colored infantry in Dow, Georgia. It had both names, but it wasn't necessarily stuck together. So you just have to do your search and then kind of filter through what you have. I found, I did a search for Robert Kirkpatrick. I found one age 43 in 1865 and I wanted to show you what the actual entry looks like. This one didn't have to be, did not happen to be my ancestor, but I wanted to show you an example. So you click on view full item, and it not only tells you the record group from the National Archives and the series that it was filmed in, but it gives you the file name. So if you ever want to go order it at the, micro, at the National Archives, you could, but in this case, the entire file is online, and what it is is the, the National Archives has made an agreement with Fold3.com. Fold3.com actually microfilmed all this stuff for, for the National Archives for free, but in exchange, they have those images on their pay site, so you have to pay to be a member of Fold3.com, but guess what? You can get the images for free by coming in through this digital library. So if, um, if you do find one of these and you can't read it real well here, I want you to see that there is a little minus sign and plus sign. That's a slider. You just slide it over and it will enlarge the image so that you can read it. And it gives you the actual file number from Fold3 that it's showing you so that you can footnote it and you can footnote it to file to that particular image number, but it is here and it's also free. So here's one of a, a little bit closer, an enlargement of what was on the screen and the enlistment that he did and the muster roll. So this was the image that I got by 
going on down. And here I noted also again that here was full three is normally a pay site. So now at the Digital Public Library, you also can track what research you're doing and be able to print that that list or use it for other work. So you want to create a particular name of your list, and I named it Kirkpatrick Research. And how you do that is on this page. Now a lot of these pages, a lot of these sites like Family Search and in this case the Digital Public Library, they want you to create a login and password. But that's only so that you can, now at Family Search they use it to keep people from stealing all their images. They know who has accessed what records and when. And they won't let you get to any images unless you have a user ID and a password. And that's just for, the, for their protection. And in this case, the digital public library will let you get the things, but if you want to create a list and then be able to come back six months from now and use that same list to go through and search, or you say you wanted to look up a, a citation for something that you had searched, you go here to the middle and create a new list, or if you have selected something over here, now it's real hard in this, on this screen to see that there is a little checkbox there. If I check it and then I click over here and say add to the list, it'll bring my lists up and then I can select my Kirkpatrick list to keep it. Now why did I bother to do that? So here's my list. I can download that list and it becomes a spreadsheet. And here I didn't have to hand record what sites I went to, the titles of the, the records I looked at. Here was what that, who created that record. Here is what's in the record that it was a, he was a private. Here's where the information came from, the National Archives. And there's actually a thumbnail link so that you can click on that link and actually get to that record again. And so it, instead of having to highlight the location in my browser and cut and pasting it into a spreadsheet, it's actually kept all that for me. So this is one way to track a lot of the, the research that you're doing, and Digital Public Library is one of the best ones to do it with. So go explore what's in the Digital Public Library and see if you can't find something on your ancestor. Another way to find archives is in Archive Grid. Archive Grid lets you find all the archives by searching their list. Uh, those of you that are familiar with libraries, OCLC is the library that keeps track of everything else. And so this is researchworks.oclc.org slash archive grid. And here you can find list of archives that are near you. And so it's showing me some of the things that are in, up in the northeast of uh, Kentucky up here and, and where the locations of these archives are. I can look for a particular archive, say in, in Texas, and then I found, because a lot of my, I'm from Texas originally, and so uh, a lot of my ancestors are there. The one I wanted to go look at was East Texas Research Center in Stephen, at Stephen F. Austin University. They have a lot of things that are online and digitized, and I wanted to search those collections. So when I clicked on that little red pen on the map, I could go search the, the collections. And it showed me more collections. So each research, like East Texas Research Center, actually has a number of different collections there. It has a repository of Texas microfilm. The, the Texas State Archives and Library have put a repository of their, all their microfilm out a number of places in Texas that are regional libraries, and East Texas Research Center happens to be one of those regional libraries that has copies of all those microfilm. And the East Texas School Men's Club has put their archives there. The, Bureau of East Texas Research has put their archives there. So it'll give you a list of what's all there. And then um, this, I want you to be sure and re at every one of these sites you go to, go take time to read how to search on the site. So on archive.grid, I just put this up here to show you that it tells you how to do the search with dust or a bowl or quote dust bowl quote and how it would retrieve the records 
Each site is slightly different, but they're pretty standard across them. But you want to go read what they say about doing a search on the sites. And in this case, I decided to go to one particular collection at East Texas Research Center, and that was the A. A. Nelson Family Letters. So some family had found a, a series of early letters from just before the uh, turn of the century. And I was going to go look at those. And here is the particular entry about the letters at the Stephen F. Austin Library. And it tells you all about the letters and who they're from and what box they're in and what folder they're in and who, all the names that were involved in those letters. So if you went directly to East Texas Research Center, look for the digital archives and collections. So you can then go from there and say, I want to search the digital archives. So look for originals, and what I would call, in this case, oops, the, um, in this case, this record was 1835 custody of orphans decision. Now, it's hard to read the whole handwriting, but the searches usually have the mentioning of a lot of the names that are in there, at least the subject of the names, and look for something that's an original to try to go look at because that's something that probably isn't indexed elsewhere. So look for things like the Runaway Slave Project or early loose records like this, the Custody of Orphans decision. Another major archive that I like to use a lot is the Portal to Texas History. Now, the Portal to Texas History has been created at the University of North Texas, texashistory.unt.edu. And they are collecting original records to put online to index. If you have family history, if you have family library uh, letters, you have original photographs, and you have artifacts from your family, this is an excellent place to archive them. They actually even have the directions on how to scan your images and you can submit them directly to them. They have little workshops all over North Texas and have people bring artifacts in and let them do microfilming or you can contact them about finding some way to either bring the archives to them or they will come microfilm them depending on what's going on. And then they digitize them and put them online. So the an uh, illustration of finding unexpected results in the portal to Texas history. I would expect to find things about people and places in Texas, but this one is an illustration of how you, I want you to think out of the box. Texas was founded by members of people that came from Alabama and Tennessee primarily, but from all over. In the Portal to Texas History, you can find records by other places. I'll give you an illustration here. And we then can filter it by type. So say I want to filter it to show me just newspapers or just photographs or just texts and documents. So they, it allows you to filter it by one particular type. You also want to look at this advanced search where you can narrow searches down to Hiram Kirkpatrick or something like that. So here's one I found as one of the 1686 clippings for the Charles B. Moore family papers. I found an obituary for James Urban Guthrie and Sarah Ann McKinley. And it he is from Sumner County, Tennessee. And that's where he died, but yet it appears in McKinney, Texas, Charles B. Moore family papers. So look at archives in either states that where people migrated from or migrated to for the, your ancestors. And here was the obituary and it gave a lot of information about that family. So we have another source of 
of many, many different titles to search. And this one is one of my favorites too, Hathi Trust. HathiTrust.org is funded by a private foundation. It has millions of titles digitized from academic and research in institutions. And you can search the catalog for descriptive items or titles. You can do a full search that includes words within the digit digitized book. So you search on the name, place, citation, even a favorite quote. And so then you include the phrase you're looking for, like the Great Depression, in quotes. Or you can use asterisk, which says match everything. So if I wanted to look for everything with Kirkpatrick, I could put K-I-R-K asterisk. If I wanted to search for Allen being A-L-L-A-N or A-L-L-E-N, I could put A-L-L question mark in. So that would be one character. So an a, a question mark is for one character, and it would find in this example they used was woman and woman by putting the question mark between the two, or an asterisk meaning match any number of characters after a certain, uh, say you put that Kirk, K-I-R-K, and then an asterisk. I went in and searched on Larissa, Texas. Now, if you'll remember back to the example I used of the John B. Renfro Bible, it said Larissa, Texas. It's a ghost town. It doesn't exist anymore. But I wanted to see what was mentioned by that location to see if I could find anything useful about the location. I found in Hathi Trust a pamphlet about settling in Texas by the IGN Railroad. And this fed, this has got a lot of meaty stuff that you could put in a family history that you're writing about. And it's, it told it about, it told about uh, going to Palestine, Texas, which is in East Texas. And um, if you're deciding to go move there, then you could go to Palestine and buy it. Is it, uh, if you buy a ticket from your nearest railroad station to Palestine, and then you would go to you could go to the ticket agent there and ask about finding a place to settle. And in it, it mentioned it talked about Larissa, Texas, where it was located. And here was a list of people that would sell you or rent you land so that you could settle in Texas. And these names are not indexed anywhere. Had I not looked by Larissa, Texas, I couldn't have found these entries. So here is this B.A. Broyles who has 40 acres of land to rent for $3 an acre. And J.C. Dodson, Larissa, Texas, wants a young man to do farm work. He'll pay the usual wages and a comfortable home. So this is wonderful material that you could not have found any other way except by looking at the locality and looking in archives. Now, as you're doing this, note that a lot of these archives have places and, and ways of citing their, their particular catalog and the, and the information they got. The interesting thing about that homes in Texas on, on the line of the International and Great Northern Railroad pamphlet that I found is that it was at Harvard University. And when I looked, that was the only place in the United States that had a copy of that pamphlet. Now, maybe there is another one somewhere, but it's not in an archive or a library catalog that I could get to. And it just boggled my mind to think, here is a pamphlet about settling in East Texas in 1880, and it was at Harvard. Now, I could export this citation, and it would actually format it for me to be used. And, uh, and it's, then you could put it into your program that you're using to, to recover your, to record your family information or put it in a paragraph and, and do a footnote for it in a, in a book that you're using. Here was a search I did at Hathi Trust on one of my ancestors, Joe Land. And Joe lived in East Texas, 
and he was sheriff of Smith County between 1910 and 1914. Now, if you have an ancestor that has Smith and Jones, you will appreciate my ancestor land because you can't just search for his name. It is going to bring up every land record, anything mentioning land anywhere. So he's very difficult to search for in any of these catalogs or anything else that are that we're doing so I but I wanted to show you that I was able to find something really useful by doing this so I said quote Joe space land here was one entry that is not my ancestor but there was a history of a regiment in South Carolina that had a, a Joe land in it however I did find a Joe land in a report from the Secretary of the State, 1902. Now note I said he was sheriff in 1910 to 1914. So I got real curious. I wanted to go see what it was. And sure enough, it's when he was elected constable, Precinct 6, in Lindale. Lindale is just northeast of, northwest of Tyler in Smith County. And that is where he was from, from Lindale. So here, I did not know he was constable in 1902. I knew he had served as constable before he was elected sheriff. I didn't realize that it was eight years before he was sheriff. So he must have served as constable for quite a while there. And in matter of fact, there were multiple entries that I've got to go back and retrieve now after finding this <laughs> for this lecture. So what I wanted to try to get across to you today was looking for unusual sources. I gave you some examples of records that I have found, how to go find some of those documents, where some of the major websites are to find those documents, how to track your sources, how to document those sources. And I hope I've inspired you to push forward and find other records rather than just looking for somebody else's family tree you can prove and disprove some of the stuff that people are putting out there on their trees by going and looking at these records. You can fill in what we, what we affectionately say, put meat on the bones of your ancestor. You can find quotes, you can find information about that ancestor and how they lived in the area they are in and how the family was affected by stuff. A lot of times why they migrated and where they went to. And so I hope this has inspired you to do some other searching. So now I'll take some questions. Okay, so if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box and I can pass them uh, along. Uh, one question I have, uh, one of the viewers said that uh, most of their relatives are not people who lived in the U.S. Do you have some suggestions for some of these good sites like this for up and uh, across the river in Europe? <laughs> the that first one, the the dp.la has immigration records for finding people that came in, but I wouldn't rule out any of these things that I have shown you to try to find records because people carried records with them. And so you may find that there are some letters that they wrote back and forth. They, you know, that they carried family Bibles, anything else with them. So, yes, it may not be as easy to do as somebody like me, as, as my husband affectionately says, my family's been here since dirt. But uh, it, don't keep your, your blinders on. I've had people come up to me. Um, and say, oh, we can't find any records because they live, my ancestors are from Czechoslovakia and it was behind the Iron Curtain. Well, once they split off from Russia and became more of an independent state, people surfaced a lot of the records. You can find records now at that Family History Library catalog. Go searching for them. And I don't know because I haven't done that much work, but go look at that catalog and search by the country. Don't put United States in there, put the country in there and kind of go down to a locality in that country and see if you can't find some other records that have been microfilmed on that. So I would start at familysearch.org and don't give up. 
because there's a lot of microfilm in a lot of other places and so uh, it's it is constantly changing I help somebody find some records from the Catholic Church in Mexico I've, yeah it's so it's I found church, uh, records for somebody in Italy and um, the FamilySearch.org also has what they call a wiki, and a wiki is a way of recording information online that people can contribute to. And go look at the wiki, Family Search wiki, and see it, find the entries on how to research that, that country. So if you go looking in the Family Search wiki for Germany, it will tell you all about how to research that country. So that's how to get started. Okay, and that was a good point about, you know, uh, church records, too, from mm -hmm. other countries. Um, here, here's a good one. Do you have any uh, suggestions on uh, records for slaves and former slaves? Yeah, that was why I showed that example there from East Texas. There is a, a push for many of us that have ancestors. If you come across any kind of record, there are places now to do it, and I cannot remember it. I will look it up and send it to you to to forward out to people, and so just make a note of it. There is a site now where people are being urged to put any any kind of reference to a slave first name there. Always do your searches by your first names if you know names off of, say, the slave census or something like that, because the name the last names may have changed. And these archives are making a big push, and this being uh, Black History Month, you will find a lot of those um, highlighted on NPR and other places that are trying to help people with, their, with Black history. There is also a podcast, uh, and I'm trying to remember Bernice's last name here, um, that has... It's called um, the, the, the National Archives and Beyond is the name of the podcast. And she's an African-American researcher, and she has wonderful guests on it. I listen to it just for any kind of research and family history. But like, for instance, she's had people on there that talked about plantation records. And uh, they're just her podcast. I would go back. She probably has several years worth of podcasts there. I'd go listen to those too. But th there are records. Don't don't give up and um, try to. If you're in a major city, see if there's an African American research group in Dallas, for instance. There is an African American genealogy group that meets there at the Dallas Public Library, and or find somebody like me that is real interested in any kind of Southern records. So uh, you know to help point you in the right direction. Uh, on the uh, family search site, somebody said that it seems that you're really limited if you're not a member of like Ancestry.com or MyHeritage.com of, of viewing things. Is that true? Well, yeah, if you, that's why I wanted to stress the way I did the search today. The way I did the search today is don't do the search records, but go through the search catalog and go to a particular locality. That would be searching records that they own the rights to, and you do not have to go to Ancestry. If you do search records, yes, it's going to pull up entries to other sites that have paid them to help link into their sites. So it's it's limited, but it's not, because I will guarantee you there are thousands of records you haven't seen if you haven't searched by the way I tried to show you today. That's so good. go search that catalog. Good suggestion. Last one that we'll have time for, uh, how about for Indian records, American Indian records? The National Archives um, has copied or, or digitized everything I know of, most of the earliest records, especially the ones where they had to record all the families after the Indian removals. Um, to Oklahoma, but all the official Indian roles. Now, if this is a person that is trying to, f to chase down the, the normal family legend of we have Indian blood, that is the harder to do. Uh, like I had that same family legend from both sides of my family. And the records are there, but they are for people that, if I have Native American blood, then it was prior to the removals to Oklahoma, 
and one of them lived in a county where a lot of Choctaw Indian were and another one lived in a county where there was a lot of Cherokee and if they were Native American they hid it so they didn't have to be removed to Oklahoma oh, oh. so I will uh, those of you that have legends and want to go find it I go look at those records because the National Archives does have those indexes but don't be discouraged because there's just it's really hard I, I did I've done DNA on a number of the sites, and one site finally came up and said I was 1% Native American. <laughs> so that should be about like six or seven generations back. So the likelihood of finding a record that spelled that out is kind of nil. But um, there is a lot of records on the Native Americans on the National Archives site. 